Here we go. Now everything should be working. All right. I guess I'll just jump in. <laughs> so first, um, thanks, Devin. First, I just wanted to to start off by saying that um, and I'm not doing this because I have or I'm looking to have any kind of job in human design. And I'm not doing this because I wanted to do some kind of, you know, tribute to or um, a story about John and my relationship. I just, I'm doing this because it was one of the last things that John asked. Um, When he specifically said, uh, you know, at one point he thought he was going to live, he thought for sure to the end of June. And he thought he was going to get to do two or three different recordings. And as he realized that his time was getting shorter and shorter and the illness was making him sicker and sicker, and he managed to get the one recording out, but he realized he probably was not going to have the strength to do anymore. He started talking to me about you, you, Devin, and me, and how we've had a really unique opportunity to observe his whole process. And he also talked to me a lot about, you know, the last couple of years and some of the changes that that happened and he, that he wanted the collective to, to know some of it. And so I did tell him I would do that. So just to set some context, when John and I met, it was the year that we both turned 51. And I had just sort of stumbled on human design and was looking around thinking I wanted to get a reading and heard some videos that John was doing and knew this was the person I wanted to have a reading from. And the first time we talked on the phone, he thought it was going to be like a 20 to 30 minute little thing prepping me for my first reading. And instead, we ended up discovering that in our lives, I guess if you talk about our geometry, our geometry had been bringing us in and out of each other's circles, spaces, and even physical presence throughout our lives. So in this very first phone call that we even had, all of a sudden, one of those examples came up and we were both completely blown away by it. It was something that was really important to him and his family and his life. And we ended up talking for two and a half hours. And that was our kickoff to getting to know one another. And I think it is so fascinating when you start learning about geometries and about the fact that we really are just these energies flying through space next to each other. And then when you start to look at how life has brought you near one another and realizing, oh, there's certain people whose, whose orbits I've been in and out of my whole entire life, whether I realized it or not. And I think that was, that sort of shifted the way that we connected and started to get to know one another. Um, but it's funny because <clears throat> while our geometries were shifting around, we were also having very similar experiences. So by the time we connected, we were both commitment phobes. <laughs> right. Neither one of us wanted to have, to be in any kind of relationships. We both had a lot of scars and pretty big pain bodies around very similar issues. And uh, I think John may have at one point put our charts side by side as our friendship started really developing, um, but never really talked to me about what that looked like or what that meant or what he saw when he put them side by side. Uh-huh. So I had no idea that... It seems like we were both uniquely um, wired, if you want to say it that way, to be able to support each other in a very unique way. What I what I can see in hindsight, looking back at this this beautiful opportunity John and I had to come together, was that life knew John was in the final two and a half years of his life, and also knew that the two of us we're going to be able to support each other, that by coming together, I would be able to support him in starting to dig even deeper into certain pain body things and certain things that needed clearing and certain assumptions that he had made that needed to be gotten rid of. And in return, I was blessed with this like incredible acceleration in my own process to be around somebody who has so much in their body already, somebody who has been working with this, has been going through this deconditioning processes, who's learning how to be this passenger in his own life. Um, these were, these, it's not like I'd never heard of the idea of being the passenger or anything. I heard it in other mystical traditions and teachings, but it wasn't like something I was already doing. 
I really believed that my mind was the thing that had helped me succeed through life. And I quickly started learning as I started working with John, how incredibly messed up that was. And he started showing me and helping me go back and review and understand the very things that I experienced in my life, that that wasn't true. That actually it was my body that had been leading the whole time. And it was my mind that was the thing that was putting up the barriers and causing so much of my suffering. So in hindsight, I really do see that at the point that life made us come together, that it was more than just, oh, this is a really fun guy you're going to have a nice time with, or this is a, a romance that's going to be great. I mean, it was those things, but it was so much more than that. Life was saying, here's an opportunity. You don't have a lot of time to do it. You guys are uniquely wired to make it happen, and it's going to happen. And the theme throughout the, the from the first conversation we had on was all about surrendering and going further and going deeper in our own processes. And it kept happening over and over with us. And I think there were times when it caught John by surprise because he had done so much work already. And then I would trigger something in him. And the next thing you know, he'd be pausing and saying, whoa, yeah, that's an old pain body. I thought I'd clear that one out, but it looks like it's back, but just at a deeper layer. And by watching him go through that, I started seeing my own things and I'd see something start to clear out and then boom, it was back again. And, and it was this incredible um, accelerated growth process that we both found ourselves in. And I think sharing this context about the beginning of the relationship and just how, I mean, it, we were literally like magnetically pulled together, whether we liked it or not. Um, it, it, it sets a context for what happened when all of a sudden we found out that he was sick. I mean, he had been sick for a year and we kept thinking it was something that was minor, um, something that could be cleared up, something that was maybe persistent and stubborn, but certainly not something that was going to kill him. And when we got the diagnosis, you know, talk about a challenge. We'd been dealing with surrendering. We'd been dealing with getting rid of our egos. We've been dealing with eating our words and our, our pride about all these things that we said we'd never do and all these things that we said weren't who we were and being stripped down to our very core and now suddenly facing that one thing that is the scariest thing for any human and that is somebody's death. And it was John that was now suddenly having to face this. And, you know, obviously we're human so there were, there were moments of anger and there were moments of frustration. There were moments of sadness. There were moments of bitterness as we talked about how could this be happening? And, you know, him admitting at times, this is scary. And I, I remember the time when he was so frustrated and he said, this doesn't make sense with my mythology, with the kind of life, you know, with who I am, that, that this would be how I'm dying. Um, I, at one point he told me his ideal way to die would be to be out surfing and get taken out by a tiger shark. He like, he liked that idea yeah. or something, you know, intense where he was out being active. And when he said that to me, it just came out of my mouth. I just said, um, actually, John, this makes perfect sense because the only thing in life left that you really fear is exactly the thing that you're facing right now. The one thing you said you never wanted to have happen was to have some kind of illness like a cancer or something that would just slowly eat at you and slowly make you weaker and weaker and you would just get more and more miserable as, as the cancer took you away. And that is exactly the thing that life is giving you. It fits your mythology perfectly to have to face the biggest fear that you have. Yeah. And from that moment on, he started to talk about it that way. And it was really beautiful to watch it as he embraced it. He said, you are exactly right. I did not want this to be my death. And so therefore it is the very thing that I have to face. And it was incredible to watch those shifts within him, to watch him take something. And it had a pain body connected to biological relatives and, and other people that he had seen and watch him figure out a way to face it as a warrior, not just in the same way he's seen others do it, but to really sit with his body and say, how am I going to face this? And at first he did think, he, he was thinking he was going to get the surgery. He was thinking there were other things he was going to do. That's when at one point we even talked about maybe we should get married. Again, that word is a scary word for both of us. Um, 
but it was, it was very typical of our relationship. It was very pragmatic. It was, you know, well, I have good health insurance and maybe this would be a great way to fight it. And his comment in return was, well, if I'm going to get married, I'd, if there's any reason to get married, it would be for this. And if I'm going to marry anyone, it would be you <laughs> because we had developed so much trust and, and respect for each other. And because neither one of us ever tried to own the other person or do anything that, uh, that fit our definition of what marriage has often come to mean in this world mm -hmm. and why neither one of us ever wanted to go down that route um, at this point in our lives. But an interesting point, you know, that's just that the mind, you know, some, an, an issue like marriage where the mind has gotten so like solid about <laughs> like, you know, nope, I don't get married. That's not for me, <laughs> you know, and, and, and what it is to really meet life in the moment and, yeah. and, and continue to, to, to leave every door of possibility open, yeah. you know, even the ones you thought, you know, in the past maybe were impossible or exactly. were certain and solid, you know, sometimes those things shift and, you know, um, being able to, you know, really like meet whatever's happening in the moment. And I, and I think that was one of the things that, you know, I got to see and that I, I'm hearing you describe, you know, a bit with John is it's just like this continual process of just, you know, um, meeting the challenge as best as you can, um, wherever you are. Well, and I, I also want to say, I mean, think about it. Here he is. He's facing death. He's miserable. He's in excruciating pain. He's, he can't keep much food down. He's, he's, he can't go even walk around the neighborhood or do anything that he loves. And now on top of that, he's being, for, he's, he's at being asked by life to surrender deeper. He's being asked by life to give up everything he made absolute statements about. And he didn't make absolute statements about very many things at this point in his life, but he still had a few. And, and here he is faced with them. And, uh, and in, in a way, we kind of supported each other since we both had made similar <laughs> absolute statements. And it was almost like grabbing each other's hand and saying, all right, I'll jump if you jump. And it was really a sweet way for us to be able to do it. Yeah. And another shattering of the mind's illusion of yeah. what it thought, you know, was reality. And um, you know, that's something John, you know, has taught, you know, his entire human design career is this shattering process and to, to see that, you know, continue to happen up until the very last, you know, moments of, of somebody's, you know, time in their vehicle. Um, it's a powerful reminder. You know, throughout the, the time that we were in our relationship leading up to his diagnosis, we had gone through so many of these surrender shatter okay i guess i do do this whatever it was but at that moment it was it was like he was being called on to to literally jump off the cliff with both feet facing this really scary thing at the worst physical conditions he could possibly be in and he kept doing it and sometimes i almost felt like he was he was better at it than i was because there was still a part of me that was kicking and screaming a little bit inside and a part of me that was still shaking my fist at the universe saying, I don't understand why you connect me with this person who, you know, has, is so such an incredible, um, person in my world. And now all of a sudden you're taking his, his time is just done. Like this just feels so deeply unfair. And I'm sure there are people like that feel the same way that were his students. Like, wait a minute, I just found this teacher. Wait a minute. You know, it, it, it's, it's, you want so much to be able to tell life that it should be on your timeline and on your terms and that you should be able to pick how long it gets to be. And I had to really give up that narrative inside of myself. And I had to really be able to settle because to be one of the people that he counted on to give him strength during this last part meant I could not be holding on to him in any way. It meant I had to completely surrender and say whatever you need, whenever you need, I'm here, I'm supporting you, you need to go when you're ready to go. And I think that was a gift. I know both you and I, Devin, and I'm sure there were others in his life that said similar things, but we both had to be able to do. We both had to say, I don't, you know, in ourselves, we knew we didn't want him to go. We were going to miss him, but we had to say, I don't want you to suffer. And I want you to be empowered to choose, to be able to say, this is it. I'm, I, my body says this is it. And I'm following my body and not do anything to make it harder. 
for him to make that choice. Um, it was a real privilege and it was also a challenge. I'm going to be completely open. It was not the easiest moment to just say, okay, go. But of course it was the right thing to do if you really truly care about someone. And he was going to go whether you liked it or not. So, you know, <laughs> it was, it was, um, yeah. No, it's, it's not easy, like you said, but it's also, you know, a big gift to be able to give somebody to just give them the freedom, you know, and the space to do whatever's correct, you know, especially around, you know, the end of the life, you know, and, and how somebody wants to meet their exit if they have that choice, if they have that awareness. And it becomes even more difficult the closer you become to someone to not have reactions to what they do or don't do. Yeah. And um, your ability to, to, to be able to support him in a time like that and give him the, the, the permission, you know, um, from the outside, as much as he was getting it from the inside, that this is okay and he's allowed to do what's correct for him is huge and and you know um thank you for, for for doing that and to everyone else in his life who is able to to recognize that it's not about what you want it's about what's correct for john and his vehicle yeah the other thing that i really noticed that i thought was interesting was that as his vehicle kept getting weaker and he was getting more tired and he had less strong like his life force was less strong um it was getting harder and harder for him to communicate with people and to animate the different roles that he played in life. Every one of us play many different roles. And after a while, there were people, you know, that he really enjoyed, but he couldn't even have them come over or he couldn't even get on the phone with them, not because he didn't care about them and didn't want to communicate with them, but it was getting harder and harder for him. And he was being stripped down to like the very core essence of this is John. It, he, he could no longer do human design sessions, which really like it was heartbreaking for him because that was his art and it was the thing he loved so much, but he couldn't even get enough strength up to be able to focus on someone well enough to do a session. And he, that was another time when he said, why am I even here? So I, not only can I not surf and run around and do the things physically that I want to do, but I can't practice my art, which is so much a purpose of my life. And then there were other people that you know, that just wanted to talk to him and be around him. And he's like, I can't be John the friend. I can't be John the neighbor. I can't be any of those things. I can only, I only have enough strength to just be. And as he got closer and closer and closer to his, his death, the amount of people that he could talk to or be around got smaller and smaller. And as he had, he, he had a lot of walls. He didn't want a lot of people to see the John that was underneath the different roles that he played. And it finally got to the point where there were just a handful of people that he could even spend time around. And, and, um, and that was a, that was actually a really humbling thing to see too. And I, I it caused me to think about myself, how open am I to being that vulnerable? How many people actually have seen just Victoria, right? Not, not me in my career or me as a, as a mom or me as anything else, but just me stripped down to my very essence. And I really watched John shedding things more and more and more until he got down to that point where it was really just that spark that was him. Yeah, and no, it's like you need less and less as, as you approach your, yeah. your exit. And, um, you know, all of your, your tools and all of your clothes and, and you just get stripped down to your, your bare self. Yeah. And cause that's all you need. And that's all that, um, it's all that's required when you, when you pass, you know, and, and the less shit you have hanging on you, the better. Um, yeah. and I guess that's, that was the sweetest, the bittersweet part of the final passing piece is that you know at the end he really only could have a couple people involved in that space not because he didn't care about many many but because it was too vulnerable he was too wide open and it was very sweet as he would as he said to me all right <clears throat> after he had asked if I would be there he said Devin's my second 
So my, he's like, he was describing, you know, like, again, the mythology of the warrior and his second. And he talked to me about how you were going to assist in the actually taking of the medicine. And then he would sort of hand off his sword in a sense and his mantle in a sense to his second. And then he wanted to have his second and his girl. <laughs> and it was, it was really beautiful the way he saw it and his realization of how simple he wanted it to be right there at the end. And that that was the way that he could find some peace in his passing. Yeah, it, it, less was more for John, like again, yeah. you know, and it, so it's always true for him. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, you know, remained to be true, you know, when he left and, and um, you know, he, he got to, to reach out to, you know, uh, a handful of people before he left. And then uh, you and I got to hold space for his actual passing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Les was definitely more for somebody who um, lived a life like John did. So. And I have to say how incredibly beautiful, if you've ever seen people struggle with the passing, if you've ever seen people cling to life, if you've ever seen people surrounded by people who weren't willing to let them pass, and you see how actually rough that passing can be for John to be able to face it the way he faced it head on. His fear was gone. He said, he was just like, I am doing this. I am doing this now. And then to know the peace that surrounded him as he passed, it was incredibly special. And that is not something that, I mean, maybe it's the way it once was, it's the way it should be, but it's not the way that it always is. So I think that is the, maybe the final thing that I, I've really been thinking about as I think about what message John wanted the collective to hear about his leading up to his death is that by following his body, by trusting his body and by surrounding himself only with those who expected nothing of him and just were there to love and support him and trust him, that he was able to, to meet it like a true warrior and have this incredibly peaceful, lovely way of crossing over. And, uh, and, and knew that we would make sure that, you know, his body would remain undisturbed for the days and that we would do everything that was necessary so that he could have as good of a crossing as, as is possible. And that was a real honor and a gift to be able to be a part of. Yeah, that was. Thank you for, for sharing. Yeah. yeah.